For today's quiz, I've got these two small strings hanging down from the ceiling. And what I'm gonna use those for is this disc. And this disc is gonna have an aluminum rod through the center. I have all the measurements of the disc and the rod, and I'm doing that off camera here, but I'll give you those values in a second. Regardless, if I put this uh, string around that rod and wound this all the way back up to the ceiling, and then we let it drop to the ground, unraveling the whole way down. How long would it take to unravel? And then maybe we could even figure out the velocity that it would go across the floor. Regardless, we would like to try to figure out the time that it would take. Let me hold up your quiz right now. And it gives you some values for the rod and the disc. Uh, the rod is 16.8 centimeters and it has 158 grams, where the aluminum rod is six millimeters and is 14 grams. As always, mark your answer as completely as possible and list your level of confidence. Typical student responses in this case are not really about the answer, but rather, how do we get the answer? Most will end up saying we should use energy. Energy is the easiest, most convenient, and that is a really good idea, except for the fact that energy doesn't really tell us about time. So our students will engage in dialogue back and forth, and most will end up thinking we should probably use Newton's laws, maybe a torque problem, something like that. So we're gonna end up getting our theoretical value and our experimental, and then we'll compare the two and see how we did. All right, I have the disc up here. It's wound and ready to go. And with any luck, we'll be able to see it go across the floor. If nothing else, we'll be able to use the timestamps from the camera and figure out its time. All right, I'm gonna release it now. There it goes. It looks like it's going pretty straight. Hopefully it'll stay that way. Oh no, it just turned. Takes off pretty fast. Neat regardless. All right, we let this drop and we were able to get, I used the timestamps off the camera and it took about 13 seconds to roll its way down and then you could hear it hitting the ground. So our theoretical work uh, will hopefully match that. We'll find out. Our experimental is about 13 seconds. A couple things that I already have drawn for us. Notice that I have this big wooden disc. It's 158 grams. And the little rod here is only, what is that, 14 grams. And the difference in size is rather large. I've already converted it to meters. So we said that this was 16.8 across here. And conveniently, I had a template for the board, so it's actually pretty accurate. And if we divide that in half, we end up with 84 millimeters once I convert, and then I can make that into meters. So I've got meters for my large radius, and then I took the six millimeter uh, diameter, cut that in half, and that will give us three millimeters, 0 .003 uh, meters. So I've got that all diagrammed out. Uh, we said that we're not gonna use energy because the tragic flaw um, uh, when using energy is you're not going to be able to say much about time, but Newton and his laws will. So let's go ahead and talk about Newton's laws. Let's use Newton's second law. We've got to finish off our diagram. Maybe I can use uh, this one. Now, I do have weight acting down, and we can say that almost all of the weight is going to come from this big disc. This small little rod, in fact, just looking at that, that's gonna be, uh, if I said, this is gonna end up being a capital M and this would be a small m, we could say that capital M is much, much greater than the small m, about 11 times. So we could say, well, um, m is approximately 11 of the smaller m. So, Maybe what we'll do is we'll just say, let's, for our first shot, um, let's just call almost all the mass being in the disc. And we're also gonna end up having a rotational system and a linear system. We need to get them to speak to one another. When this was rotating down, looking from this side, we would end up 
rotating in that direction. I'm going to just operationalize that as being positive just to make our life easy. So I'll say that's a positive direction. But that also means as this is going to be dropping down towards the floor, I should make down positive also because it's going to be accelerating in a downward direction. And so we're going to operationalize down as being positive also. And that way the two systems can speak to one another. Once I have that, I probably need to put uh, my weight and my tension on there. I'm only gonna draw one tension. Yes, there's two strings going up, but I could have very easily made them into one string just for simplicity. Let's do it that way. And I can pick any one of these diagrams. These are uh, either side views or front views, but regardless, I could say, um, maybe I'll use this one right here. I've got some weight. And we're just going to call that mg, and then I'll end up saying, well, I'm going to end up having a tension, and that's going to come from right here. I'll just use, maybe I'll use this side. And you'll notice that tension is going to end up being smaller than the weight. So it's still going to accelerate down. So we can use Newton's second law, and I think I can squeeze that right here. I can write um, sum of the forces equals... And A, I have two forces acting on this. I'll say my weight minus my tension. So I could say weight minus my tension equals my MA. And really, I should just be using the capital M at this point if we're assuming that the one mass is just going to be much, much larger. And 10 times, I don't know if you consider that much, much larger, but large enough for at least our first pass through here. So, um... Now I'm kind of stuck and I don't know where to go, but I do want to end up finding the acceleration here. So, because if I can find the acceleration, I can use all my kinematics equations, V, F, V, I, A, T, and D, and one of our three kinematics equations to solve for the time. And then hopefully it's going to be around 13 seconds or something. Hopefully that's what our theoretical work will come out with. Let's find out. Um, now we are ready for our torque that is gonna cause this thing to rotate. Look, when that string was wound around here, the force is gonna be going up from our tension, but it's gonna be acting at this small radius. It's not wrapped around the big disc, just around that small rod. So we can end up writing Newton's uh, second law for torque here. I can write sum of the torques equals our I alpha. And I think we can see that our tension acting at this little radius right here. So I could put it right there, make that tension the same, is gonna give us our torque. So I could say where torque equals some force perpendicular acting at a distance. Our force perpendicular is necessarily gonna be our tension. And our distance is gonna end up being that little tiny r. So I could say, uh, also known as tension times R. And I'll put that in. So I've got my tension times little r equals, now a disc is going to end up having a one-half mR squared moment of inertia. So we'll use that. I can end up saying one-half. Now, we're going to use the big M here, big M, we're also going to end up using this large radius because that's really what the moment of inertia is all about, r squared, and then I've got my alpha. Give a better alpha than that. Now, look, angular acceleration can be uh, related to our linear acceleration by, and I can put another where statement, where um, acceleration tangential equals r alpha. So alpha can just be A over R. So when I use that alpha, though, I have to use the R that's giving me the speed, and that's the small R. It's this one here, not that big one. I don't have the string wrapped around the outside of this disc, not the big R, the little R. So um, a lot of kids are going to end up saying, well, if I put this R in for here, it's going to cross out with that other R. It doesn't. Let me show you. 
T times R equals one half mass, radius squared, and this is gonna end up being uh, our alpha is gonna end up being A all over our R. Now what I can do is I can divide both sides by R and make that an R squared. So I can say T times, let me do this a lower, T times, better, better, T equals one half our mass, radius squared, all over this radius squared, A. And maybe I'll put those in right now and get that out of the way. Uh, I've got my calculator here, so I can use my capital R, which is 0 .084, which I'll put into here. Maybe I'll put this out to the side, where R squared all over R squared is 0 .084 meters squared all over R 0 .003 meters, and I'll square those. Probably running out of space on the um, board here. Hopefully it'll pick this up. 0 .084, and I can write that, uh, and I'll square that. It's going to be 0 .007056 meters squared all over R um, divided by 0 .003 x squared, 0 0.0009, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 9 meters squared. Hopefully I can hit the equal and it'll take both of those together, 784. So we end up with 784. And notice our meters squared cross out. So that number can be put right into here. So I can end up saying the tension equals our one half uh, I'll put our 784 for that, MA. Tension would be equal to 784 divided by 2, 392. So I'll put 392, capital MA. Now that I've got that tension, I can plug it right up into here. And so let's go plug that in right up there. And I can say weight minus... 392, capital MA equals MA. Take it to the other side, it becomes positive. Weight equals MA plus 392 MA. Weight equals our 393 uh, MA. And then weight is just MG, so I can put that in here. I can end up saying M. G equals 393 MA. Masses cross out. A equals G divided by 393. Our acceleration that this thing's going down, uh, let me put that on the bottom. X times 9.8. Very, very small value. 0 meters per second squared. All right, now, you might wanna give a pause here, see if your students can then solve for the time. If, if this is gonna be going down, can they solve for the time? Let's pause right here, because I've just done a lot of work. All right, give them a second. All right, hopefully your students can do the rest of this by saying, well look, I'm starting with some velocity initial equal to zero, It'll end up having some velocity down here. We don't know that one right now. Uh, we certainly have an acceleration. And I want to find the total amount of time for here. So what is the time equal to? That doesn't look great. Time equals what? From here to here. So we have kinematics equations, one, two, three. Almost all physics students know these after, um, you know, just a little bit in physics one. So I always have them list their variables and I'll have them, I'm gonna sit here, make this a little easier, and I'll put my um, VF, VI, A, T, D. We know that we started with a VI of zero, so I can put zero here. Our acceleration is uh, point um, zero, I, I guess we're leaving that positive, point zero, two, five, 
and that is meters per second squared, and our distance uh, was 2.1 meters going down. We'll leave that positive. We can make them negative now if we wanted to. But regardless, I measured it's about 2.1 uh, meters that it fell. Probably use equation 3, which is going to be our distance equals our velocity initial times time plus 1 half a uh, t squared. And remember, that vi is going to be 0, so that just goes away if that's equal to 0. So d equals 1 half a and then we would do t squared. t squared would be equal to 2d all over a. Square root that side, square root that side. t equals the square root of 2 times our distance of 2.1 meters divided by our very, very slow acceleration. And we saw that it was incredibly slow. 0.025. Uh, meters per second squared. Let's see what we end up getting. Let me grab my calculator. Uh, this is going to be 4.1 divided by 0 0.025, and that would be 164. And that would be seconds squared. Hopefully this is still picking it up. And then when I square root that, I get 12.8. 12.8 seconds. Time equals 12.8 seconds. That is incredibly good correspondence between our theoretical and our experimental. I did not think it would be that close. And here's why. This is a very, very light disc, and um, it's, it's rough on the edge here, so it's probably generating a little bit of wind. Um, I did measure everything pretty well. I just, I'd be surprised if I if I did this with several, several trials, if I ended up getting uh, that same, you know, close correspondence. It wobbles a bit, it starts to turn. Sometimes the string will hit here. But I have to say, I'm really happy about that. We'll take that one as a win. Um, I wanted to try to get the velocity of this when it hit the ground and took off, but I, it didn't go straight. So um, it did go pretty quick. Maybe uh, we can use that film footage and get the velocity uh, at some other time. but. Uh, it really took off and uh, smashed into either a chair or a wall. Uh, a lot of fun. Um, these are neat problems to work with your students and, uh, you know, just another technique that you have in your bag of tricks for them. Newton's laws work out pretty well. All right, that's your quiz for today. Thank you for watching another Idealized Science Institute video. We are a nonprofit organization. If you like what you've seen, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want, leave a comment below. It's helpful to us. If you can financially support us, go to our website and hit the donate button. If you can't, simply by sharing these videos with other teachers and students in your life will be helpful. While at our website, you'll find that we have our Idealized Science Institute book that'll help you engage your students in dialogic discourse. There you'll also find we have a podcast where we break down educational research. We also have long form lessons if you're a teacher, you can watch these and go in the very next day and enact these. Along with this, we also have many other resources, including more quick quizzes. So thank you for watching, and we hope to see you in the next one.